My name is Elizabeth Way, and I'm an Associate Curator here at the Museum at FIT. I'm Melissa Mara Alvarez, and I'm the Curator of Education and Research at the Museum at FIT. We're going to talk today about our exhibition, Head to Toe. So tell me, what is our exhibition about? Um, well, this is an exhibition that looks at the history of fashion through the lens of fashion accessories. Um, and it does two things, right? It looks at how accessories um, contribute to the total look of an ensemble, but it also looks at the, co the socially constructed ideas, right, that accessories can communicate about race, power, class, uh, femininity. And how, how did we come up with the idea for this exhibition? Oh, God, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> this was years ago now, yeah. um, because we originally meant to open in May 2020. That's right. So we had planned the exhibition maybe about a year and a half in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and what we had wanted to do, I think if I remember correctly, is that we wanted to do something that looked at women's total ensembles, right? Head to toe looks, mm -hmm. essentially. And to do an exhibition where we got to display some of the things in the collection that we don't often get to display. Yes, because mostly we tend to exhibit like cat shoes and handbags, but mm -hmm. this was a great opportunity to kind of dig in the collection and pull out some things that are more unique, right? Like parasols or costume jewelry. And this is a really large exhibition in one way because we have so many accessories. We have over 300 individual objects in the show. <laughs> yes. Um, but I think it's course, one of our biggest, ex like mo most objects. <laughs> it might win. It might win for the most <laughs> amount of objects. But it's so many small pieces put together in cases. It doesn't have a bigger footprint than a typical exhibition in our history gallery. Right. We had been planning it for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and we were almost there, right? We were almost ready to say we had our labels done. And then the pandemic hit. Almost everything was ready to go. So we would have just had final casework. Um, the actual installation and dressing before the installation, we were in that stage right when the pandemic hit. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people have asked um, how the pandemic kind of impacted how we curated. And I think one of the biggest things was it really just kind of slowed down sort of the end production, right? Mm -hmm. Case installation, some of the dressing of the mannequins. Um, but it also kind of gave us this unique opportunity to sort of slow down at the very end and take a look back at the exhibition with the pandemic in mind. Would you agree? Absolutely. We changed a couple of things. We added a couple of things. We added three masks to the very, very beginning of our exhibition. Mm -hmm. When we were planning this exhibition, masks were not We're not an accessory <laughs> included <laughs> in the show. <laughs> so we have two by the designer Michael Kay, who is an FIT alum, mm -hmm. and we are really happy to include his pieces. Um, the, the mask that we have of his that has the poppy the print, I really love that piece because it kind of calls back to this World War I era when we were also experiencing a pandemic, the flu <laughs> pandemic. And so I thought that was a really kind of interesting connection between that period and now. Yeah, it's a great tie-in. And that's a very beautiful Liberty of London fabric too, which is, which is special. Um, and then we picked another mask because we have three that we featured at the very mm -hmm. entrance of the exhibition, um, which was a mask that was made from dead stock fabrics by the New York designer um, Kalina Strada. And that has a much, it has a real fashion aspect yeah. to it, right? So we see how like all of these designers were pivoting um, from making fashion to making masks. Mm -hmm. um, and then how these masks almost take on this kind of fashion sense of their own, right? They really do become an accessory. And that wasn't necessarily true at the very, very beginning of the pandemic, but by mm -hmm. the time, um, um, certainly a few months in, people were trying to become more creative, coordinate mm -hmm. their masks with their outfits, and so they did become a bit of a fashion accessory. Yeah, so that became like an unexpected kind of <laughs> a new uh, tie-in to the accessories show. Yes. Um, but it was fun to be able to, to include that. And now that we are finally open, um, what is your favorite piece in the exhibition? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> There's so many pieces that I love. Um, 300. <laughs> I, think, I think it's not necessarily a piece, but I think one of my sort of favorite moments or sections in the exhibition is the big case of 1940s fashion accessories. Mm -hmm. I loved this opportunity to be able to select um, so many different accessories from one kind of decade and look at how important they were and how interchangeable they were. There was this big push during the 1940s for sort of background dresses, right? So plain, um, plain dresses or suits that could essentially serve as a background to the fashion accessories. And it's really the fashion accessories that take center stage at this time. And they're helping women transition their outfits from day to evening or from serious to whimsical. And so that is like one of my, I think, 
kind of favorite cases in the show. What about you, Liz? What's one of your favorite pieces? So the fa my favorite type of piece, I would say, are the parasols. Because we haven't displayed parasols very, very often. We have displayed a couple in the past. Valerie had one in her um, Paris Capital of Fashion exhibition. Mm -hmm. But we have four on display in different sections of the exhibition, and they range from about 1850 to about 1910. And I really like parasols because they are not accessories that we really think about today. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see people on the street using them in a very utilitarian way to block the sun, but mostly, you know, they're kind of gone from our fashion landscape. Yeah. But they were sure. really important in the 19th century. Um, you know, they shaded you from the sun, which is very important because people, women, upper class women, did not want tan skin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we think about um, colonization and imperialism, um, there was a real distinction between people of color and white people. Mm -hmm. And so white people really wanted to guard that whiteness. But parasols were also like kind of these little frou-frou, kind of expensive fashion objects that showed off how wealthy and how fashionable and how chic you were. And so they really were kind of accessory in this way that, you know, they weren't like shoes um, or gloves that kind of um, were more kind of on the body, but there was something you carried and people could use them to gesture and could use them um, to hide their face or reveal their face. So I really like kind of the flirtatious aspect of parasols. Yes, and they become very associated with femininity, right? Mm -hmm. um, almost these like extensions of a woman's femininity, which was something I was found really interesting when we were doing this exhibition. I mean, I think you found like some satirical cartoons that looked at like the shape, the dome shape of yes, the parasol yes. in the 1860s and like the dome shape of, of the woman. skirts, yeah. And it was like women were becoming their accessories. Yeah. There's some really interesting, interesting kind of comments on women and society when we look at their accessories. One of the most kind of important or f interesting things that I pulled out of working on this exhibition was looking at these historical accessories and then thinking about what their kind of contemporary counterpart might be. Mm -hmm. And so when we were talking and having those discussions, that is essentially what becomes like the introductory gallery of the exhibition. And to me, that was so much fun, like thinking about accessories along those lines. So why a 19th century woman might wear a parasol today, um, you know, to shield her from the sun. Today, women wear sunglasses, right? And so there they have Similar, similar associations, yet they're also very different, right? Sunglasses develop as kind of leisure accessories. Mm -hmm. They connote fun. They also connote sort of coolness by the, by the 60s and the 80s. Um, and so I thought that was um, a kind of really rich and, and fun area to explore when we were working on this. Absolutely. I love the juxtaposition we create between the makeup compact, which is like this That's beautiful velvet favorite. case that looks like a purse from the 1920s, and then a cell phone case. It's our most contemporary piece, I believe, from 2020, is a Prada cell phone holder. Mm -hmm. And it has this tiny little Prada backpack that you can put like your phone in, so it's like your phone is wearing this backpack. Mm -hmm. But it's like these things that you hold in your hand or you kind of you know, hang from your body, and it's all about gesture, and it's all about um, kind of the movement of it in your hand, but it's also really about modernity. Mm -hmm. Cell phones are so obviously about modernity and technology, but makeup was something that really marked 1920s young women mm -hmm. as modern and yeah. moving in the world because it wasn't acceptable for their mothers to wear visible yeah. makeup. But by the 20s, um, you know, they're not just wearing it, they're carrying their compacts around and they're touching up their makeup throughout the day. So I really loved um, kind of how those things kind of mirror each other. They're very different and used for very different things. Mm -hmm. um, but they also have like kind of this continuity over time. Yeah, ideas of progress and modernity. It's it's um, it was so interesting. So a lot of our pieces from the 19th century do not have kind of makers associated with them that we know of. But towards the 20th century, um, definitely we have a lot of great designers featured in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So what are some of um, your favorite designers that we show? Oh wow. Um, well, I think in terms of strictly sort of accessory designers. It was really fun to include hats by Lily Dashe mm -hmm. or the milliner Stephen Jones. I think as far as shoes, we had to include sort of some iconic shoe designers like Ferragamo and Louboutin, mm -hmm. Christian Louboutin, and Manolo Blahnik. Uh, what about you, if you have some? Um, we have some great designers um, who are really more known for clothes, but who do great accessories. For example, we have Yoji Yamamoto. Mm -hmm. We have a pair of his like kind of furry mules yes. um, from the uh, early 2000s. Um, Stella Jean has a really beautiful pair of little booties that she collaborated with Christian Louboutin on. Oh yeah, those are great. Made of wax print. Um, I really love those. And of course, we have some really kind of classic pieces. We have Hermes handbags, handbags by Chanel and Louis Vuitton. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, hats by Balenciaga. And also we have a few um, clothing pieces as well in the exhibition. We have um, suits by Balenciaga, Alaya. Um, who else do we have? Vivian Tam. Stephen Burroughs, Halston, mm -hmm. Claire McCardle. Yes. A great, great um, outfit by Claire McCardle. And we have some really fun kind of space age accessories by yeah. couturiers. So we have Paco Rabanne pieces, Andre Correge, and Pierre Cardin, who are creating these really wild kind of space age accessories mm -hmm. in the 1960s. Um, you know, as you were kind of talking about sort of fashion designers who are also producing accessories, um, it also just got me thinking, you know, I think one of the also interesting aspects of the exhibition is that really it's focusing on accessories. And so while there are great fashions on display, um, they are in a sense serving as um, a backdrop or a placeholder for these accessories that, that we are you know, referencing them mm -hmm. against, um, which might make it a little different than some of the other exhibitions that we've shown here. Would you agree? Definitely, because usually we think of accessories as kind of ancillary, mm -hmm. extra. Right. But here we definitely put accessories center stage, yes. and it's the clothing that are really just kind of there to give you a bit more of the context. The, the context, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so I think that's what's really special about Head to Toe is that we really look at accessories, not only how important they were, how fashionable they were, but their roles in women's lives and yeah. what they're communicating. And they communicate a lot of important things so about much. class and race and femininity and modernity. Um, so it was a lot of fun to kind of dig into the meanings behind the accessories. Yes, I love that part of it too. <laughs> <laughs> so Liz, how would you characterize um, a fashion accessory? So accessories are kind of the obvious things that we think of shoes, bags, gloves, shawls, hats, and we cover all of those in the exhibition. Um, but we kind of, you know, I think everyone has a different definition. We definitely stretch it to include things like, you know, hair jewelry, mm -hmm. costume jewelry, but also kind of fragrances, makeup, compacts. Um, so we have kind of a mix. And really it was, what did we have in our collection? Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that weren't clothing, but were very um, important to fashion that we could kind of deem an accessory? Yes, yeah, so we definitely sort of present a broad, wider range of, of fashion accessories. Absolutely. So if we think about different decades, what were the important accessories decade by decade? Uh, well, it's interesting because, right, we started off thinking about when we were curating the show, that's exactly how we were trying mm -hmm. to kind of frame um, the exhibition, right? So we started off thinking like, okay, early 19th century, what are the most important fashion accessories? And I think two of them that we um, pulled out for at least the first half of the 19th century were shawls and hats. Yes. So shawls were really important at the turn of the 19th century because we have this big silhouette change. Instead of like these um, kind of wide skirts and things that we associate with the late 18th century, we have this neoclassical silhouette that's very columnar. It's very um, kind of thin and it's very kind of almost undecorated compared to mm -hmm. what we had come before it. So women historically used to put their things in their pockets. Mm -hmm. um, but because we have this really columnar silhouette, we can't have pockets anymore. So women start to carry handbags or reticules. They're these cloth handbags. Um, and this is kind of the, um, the early stages of what we think about the modern day purse. But shawls were also really important because these dresses were very thin and they were very um, flimsy because yes. uh, white cotton muslin was very popular. So they needed shawls for warmth. Mm -hmm. But shawls were also really important in kind of defining European imperialism at this time because cashmere shawls were the most fashionable shawls, something that the Empress Josephine, wife of Napoleon, really helped make popular. Um, and they were produced in Northern India and they came into France into kind of Josephine's world through um, Napoleon's campaign in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And you know, so they were a luxury item that was widely circulated in Asia before Europeans had ever kind of discovered them. But because of Napoleon's kind of imperialistic ambitions and his campaigns, they were able to bring, Frenchmen were able to bring back this kind of sign of the East and a sign of their kind of colonial um, kind of success. And so cashmere shawls were, they were absolutely beautiful. They were so finely woven, they were so soft but they really were a symbol of kind of Europe conquering um, the outside world. And so we have a lot of issues about race and colonialism that are wrapped up in this very beautiful accessory um, that stayed fashionable in Europe for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, shawls are so adaptable to any silhouette. So, I mean, they were popular kind of through the 1850s and 60s. Yeah, um, through, yeah, you could even say like through the 19th, most of the 19th century. Absolutely. Um, and it is so interesting, right, to look at this sort of functional aspect of the accessory and then also sort of the social cultural implications of the accessory, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, we were also looking at 19th century um, 
we looked at hats and how they're associated with modesty mm-hmm. um, and how that shifts throughout the century, right? Because women were expected to cover their heads as a sign of propriety. And then later um, in the Victorian era, kind of bonnets give way to hats, and that's this symbol of sort of youth and modernity. Um, and so these are kind of the way that we're exploring and, and approaching fashion accessories. Um, I would say probably in the second half of the 19th century, the other, other accessories that we highlight are fans and parasols. Mm-hmm. Both of those were very much considered extensions of femininity, Mm -hmm. but they also have other connotations, right? Fans were associated with this sort of nostalgia for the 18th century and this aristocracy, right? So by the mid-19th century, fashion accessories were accessible to people of most classes, Mm -hmm. right? And so with this privilege of accessories, there's this need to show kind of an elite accessory. And so fan is um, one example. It's very feminine, um, but... It's also looking back at the European aristocratic courts Mm -hmm. um, and how women would um, sort of display their femininity and the sense of luxury around fans, right? Absolutely. By the mid-19th century with industrialization, you have, you know, really cheaply produced fans. So people of, you know, the working classes can buy these fashionable accessories. Um, And so you also see this breakaway to these really beautiful fans made out of silk and they're hand-painted. We have a piece um, by Develle who Mm -hmm. is like, a couturier kind of a fans almost um, in Paris. And so we see these really beautiful, almost art objects on one hand of the spectrum. And then we have these really affordable kind of industrialized products um, on the other. Yes. And de Valeray was actually the fan maker to Queen Victoria, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of an interesting tidbit of information if you're talking about um, sort of how exclusive these fans were. They were like little works of art. And I want to talk a little bit about the sources that we drew from. So Susan Heiner is a fashion historian who wrote a lot about accessories, and she was a really great resource. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also looked at a lot of um, kind of contemporary press and etiquette books. Etiquette books, yes, definitely etiquette there books. There are lots of advice for women in the 19th century about how they should dress mm-hmm. and how they shouldn't dress and what accessories were appropriate. Yes, and even by the early 1900s, there's fashion magazines that are kind of dictating to women and telling them that you can tell how well-dressed a woman is by her fashion accessories. Mm -hmm. So that's like how much they communicate and how important they were to a woman's um, total look. One of my favorite kind of anecdotes from an etiquette book was this warning to young women not to wear overly fancy, expensive hats. Mm -hmm. Because the message that you're communicating to your future husband is that you spend a lot of money, that you're obsessed with fashion, and they're not going to marry you because you (laughs) will ruin them with your expensive (laughs) hats. So young women were advised to wear simple hats, and the more ornate kind of bonnets were reserved for married women. Yeah, I mean, on that note, Liz, I think another really interesting aspect that came out of the etiquette books that we were looking at was, you know, you think about a well-dressed woman today, and you think about someone who's going to stand out, right, like a style, an arbiter of style or a style icon. Um, but you have all these etiquette books in the 1850s that are urging women to just blend in. Like mm-hmm. a well-dressed woman is someone who doesn't stand out. She blends in. You have to follow, conform with these types of accessories. And it's just so different than the mindset that we have today, right? Absolutely. I also love advice about gloves. Women were meant to have dozens and dozens of gloves because you would never have dirty gloves. Mm -hmm. But gloves were another accessory that where you really see a convergence of like class and race. Absolutely. Because it was all about protecting the whiteness of the hands from tanning, but also the delicacy. And so, you know, well-bred women had small, delicate hands that were always in these white gloves. Mm -hmm. Um, But they were also kind of these tools that working class women um, and women of color could use to kind of... um, ascribed to this ladylike um, kind of status. Mm -hmm. You know, working class women could cover the the signs of wear on their hands um, with gloves. So it was this area where you could have um, kind of class slippage. Well, yeah, there's, I, what I love is like there's this kind of duplicitous nature there with the mm-hmm. glove, right? They can um, protect your hands, but they can also conceal and trick people, right? Or fool, um, you know, or cover sort of these idea of working class hands. Mm-hmm. So when we get into the 60s and 70s, we start to see a lot more individuality when mm-hmm. it comes to accessories. And so we kind of shift at this point um, and we think about less about categories of accessories and we think more about like style tribes yes. and how accessories all work together to kind of convey this look. Mm-hmm. So for the 60s, we look at mod accessories, we look at space age accessories. Mm-hmm. 
In the 70s, we have a case of hippie accessories um, and also kind of this disco Studio 54 kind of case of accessories. Yes. Um, but talk to me a little bit about the 80s and sunglasses. Well, well, in the 80s, we see sort of style tribes proliferate even more. And a lot of this is kind of even driven um, by music subcultures. Mm -hmm. So by the 1980s, you have everybody wearing sunglasses um, from boardroom CEOs to kind of um, cool, affected punk teens. And so that's what's so interesting about them. And because they become such a ubiquitous accessory during the 1980s, um, you have a lot of fashion designers who also start to begin to produce sunglasses. And so we have some Versace sunglasses, Claude Montana sunglasses, but it's this beginning of um, this kind of conspicuous consumption designer sunglass era that we're really still in today, oh, if yeah. you think about it. Uh, we also included in the exhibition, which is one of my favorite little um, extras, is a little clip from the 1980s Corey Hart song, I Wear My Sunglasses at Night. But that just shows you, I mean, how popular sunglasses were, <laughs> that there was a hit song and a music video um, all dedicated to sunglasses. One of kind of the areas where you really see how much work accessories do to kind of create the look of an ensemble is in the 90s section. And you put together a Vivian Tam slip dress, a very kind of um, 90s, um, simple black slip dress. Mm -hmm. But in two cases next to it, you have, what do you have? What? Um, so yeah, so we're, it was looking at um, 90s minimalism, right? So the slip dress is the ubiquitous kind of 90s minimalist garment, right? And so we, and what's so interesting is how, because of, because garments become so minimal, how much power accessories have just to, to change an outfit or to shift it. So we pair this lip dress with a pair of Doc Martin boots um, and a pair of Manolo Blahnik mules. And this idea that just by changing your shoes, you can make a dress go from grunge to glam, yeah. right? And so that's, um, it's just, to me, that was so powerful. And I, I remember being a teen in the 90s and, and having that kind of idea, like, you know, no, I couldn't be too dressed up. I had to wear boots with my dress, and that was going to change the, the tone of, the, of the, my ensemble, my outfit, or whatever. And it's such a great callback to the 1940s when women exactly. were wearing these very plain clothes, and it, they were relying on the accessories to take yes. you from day to night to yes. mark the occasion. Yes, and I think that people who visit the exhibition um, will hopefully kind of see those themes kind of resurface every so often, and, and in some instances, it's, a same concept, but then it's also changing because it's in a new era and it has a slightly different meaning or context. So the very end of the exhibition looks at kind of the turn of the millennium. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we talk about is shoes and bags really become the accessories. Yes. And I would say that's still true today. Yes. Shoes and bags are kind of the accessories that everyone spends money on, that they pay the most attention to. And so we have a Fendi baguette bag. And what is special about the baguette bag? Well, the baguette bag um, was initially released in 1997, and it was the first it bag. So if we think of how many it bags or iterations of an it bag we've seen over the years, um, the Fendi was the one that started it all. And this was a bag that there were wait lists for, that celebrities were carrying, that was photographed everywhere. Um, and it paves the way for other handbags that are also on display in that section of the exhibition, such as the Dearissimo saddle bag or Louis Vuitton on um, Murakami collaboration of the speed, the colorful Speedy 30 handbag. Um, and then the exhibition also in that section closes or is looking at, as you mentioned, shoes, mm -hmm. right? And shoes are something that we wear all the time. Um, and they're so personal, right? We, we pick our shoes. They are so indicative of a woman's personal style. And so what we tried to show, in this, I think you would agree, um, at the end of the exhibition, was this wide range of shoe styles that, mm -hmm. that can cater to women, whether it's super trendy, whether you're going glam and elegant, or you're an avant-garde woman. Um, so many, you know, shoes can, they're so expressive mm -hmm. about a woman's personal style. And I'm, some of the standout pieces, we have a giant case of shoes. Um, we have the Penzi Louboutins, which were oh, yes, his first right. pair right. that with the red bottoms. Yes. Um, and right. we also have um, probably one of many pairs of Manolo Blahniks. And something that I find so interesting is the role that pop culture has played in kind of elevating fashion to this kind of everyday vocabulary. So you think about like Sex in the City, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was young, but I didn't know who Manolo Blahnik was before I watched Sex in the City. And I think a lot of people in America and around the world probably could say the same. And so uh, it's interesting. It, for sure, I mean, that show definitely made those two shoe designers like household names. Mm -hmm. um, I, everybody knew who they were and, and was aware of their shoe designs. Um, and shoes are, you know, shoes are this one accessory. I think they're like handbags too, but maybe even more so. Um, 
they're aspirational and they're attainable. They mm -hmm. might be super, super expensive, but you know, somebody could potentially save up enough money to buy this coveted pair of shoes. Um, and I think that's part of what makes them so appealing today and why they've had such long stand appeal, right? Absolutely. We really start to see shoes become much more interesting in like the turn of the century. We start to get like these boots um, and in the 1910s, we have these beautiful shoes with decorative heels, mm -hmm. but it's really in the 20s and 30s when hemlines come up right. that we see these beautiful, beautiful shoes that are very, very fashionable, mm -hmm. that are really more about kind of fashion than function, perhaps. Um, but we have a big case in that section as well in the 20s and 30s yes. that looks at all different types of shoes from like kind of, we have a pair of high-heeled galoshes, so, um, you know, rubber rain shoes that you can slip those. your high heel <laughs> shoe into yes. and keep them dry. But also like these beautiful silk and pieced leather and metallic shoes. Um, it's really the time when we start to see beautiful, beautiful shoes come, um, come into fashion. Yeah, feet are on display. So, yeah. you know, they're um, very noticeable. So we stopped the show about 2000. Yeah, 2000, 2003, around there, very early. So it's about 200 years of kind of accessories and fashion. But if we were going to take the show up to today, mm -hmm. I know that we would have to include a Telfar bag. Oh, for sure. I'm talking about the It bag yes. of like 2020, 2021, 2022, probably. Yes. Um, and we have one in our collection, so we're really, really happy to have that. That's a new acquisition. Yes. Um, but... Uh, too dated too far in the future for our <laughs> exhibition. What other things would we have if we took it up to the current moment? Um, I think we definitely need some um, very contemporary sunglasses. Mm -hmm. um, I also think headbands have been have had a real popular moment um, for the past few months. So I think we would definitely have some maybe decorative head headwear headbands. Mm -hmm. And we do have a headband in the show from the 1940s. Yes. Um, but yes, I think we would have to have a, a more present day kind of. Um, Bejeweled, bejeweled hair. And I also think this um, cell phone accessories. We have one. Yes. I think there's such a wide range of those right mm -hmm. now um, that I think this aspect of technology and that we're always dressing up our technology as if it was a fashion accessory yeah. um, is is really prominent right now as well. Well, it is the ultimate accessory. Like everyone has their phone on them yeah. all the time. So you want to make it part of yeah. your outfit. That's a great one. Um, we do include masks, but um, hopefully in the next couple years, masks will no longer be a fashion accessory. <laughs> there's, you know, there's so many um, designers who are doing great things with sneakers. Sneakers mm -hmm. are really having a moment Absolutely. too. Absolutely. And uh, I think if we were including present day accessories, we'd have to have some really interesting examples of sneakers. I find myself wearing sneakers more and more now um, than ever before. Absolutely. And, you know, not just like kind of the classics like Reebok, Nike, Adidas doing like really, really cool sneakers, but also high fashion companies. Exactly. Dior, Chanel, Balenciaga, all doing their yeah, own. sneaker culture is so important. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Melissa, what would you say is your favorite kind of accessory? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I think I would have, I, I'm a big shoe person. I like shoes. Um, so I would say I would have to be shoes. What about you, Liz? I, I think shoes, shoes for me too. <laughs> Jewelry is a good one, but I think shoes. In the city, you have to have, you have to have like fashionable shoes, but also sturdy shoes. Comfortable shoes. Yeah. Yes. If, if you look under my desk, I've got tons <laughs> of shoes hidden under there. Mine are um, my filing cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think we're both big fans of shoes. Yeah. Shoes, and I, I would often say I had growing kind of attachments to sunglasses lately too. I feel like there's a lot of fashion that can be expressed through sunglasses. Absolutely. And now, you know, now that we're out in the world again, yeah. we, we have like the focus on the face from the Zoom meetings, but now we can take it out into the world. So I think <laughs> sunglasses and like, like you were saying with headbands, like, you know, there's a lot of focus right here mm -hmm. um, because we've all been at home so long, but now we can kind of take our faces out into the world. Yeah. And I just read an article that was saying, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, that earrings are coming back, like yeah. big statement earrings. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, whether that's a product of like sort of Zoom culture that we're all just being seen from sort of the chest up or what, but um, earrings are another big um, fashion accessory of the moment. Well, no matter what kind of body part people are, fo fashion is focusing on, there's an accessory to kind of highlight it. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Come and visit us at the museum at FIT. Head to toe will be on view from November 17th, 2021 to May 8th, 2022. The museum at FIT is open Wednesday through Friday from 12 to 8, Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 5. We're open to the public free of charge, so please come check us out.